Hey y'all, welcome to the inaugural Heavy Cardboard Top 6 list. First off, if you're not familiar with Heavy Cardboard, we are a podcast and YouTube channel that focuses on the heavier end of the board game hobby. Now, you might be asking yourself, self, why Top 6? Well, we review and rate games on a 1 to 6 scale, so it ties all together. Now, why on a 1 to 6 scale? Well, 1 to 10, bit too granular. I mean, seriously, what's the difference between a 6 and a 7 or a 4 and a 5? There's really not much. Whereas a 1 to 4 is way too limiting. We found this out our first few episodes. So we found 1 to 6 works for us the last couple of years. So here we are. Let me uh, take care of the chat for you guys. Here we go. All right. So, today is uh, our first top six list, biggest recent surprise in board games. Now, while it doesn't have a hard, fast limit as to, you know, a time frame that we're looking to limit this to, but we'll say the last year to 18 months that's new to us, been a surprise to us. And by us, now, my co-host and wife, who normally sits either over there or over here, She's at work right now, so you're going to have to listen to next week's episode or this week's episode on Thursday to get her take on this. So when I say us, she's here in spirit, Amanda. So like I said, last 12 to 18 months or so, we're looking at as far as uh, surprise to us, new to us, exciting and didn't see that coming type game. Uh, now, we're going to keep this positive, so these are going to be pleasant surprises. I'm not going to say that all of our top six li lists are going to be all positive and, and puppy dogs and ice cream and rainbows, whereas this one will be, so I figure it started on an upbeat note, right? All right, now, this is my list, right? Like, I... It, it, it's it's partially my show so i'm gonna break the rules and now my old co-host tony wouldn't have allowed this uh but but i get away with it because well he's no longer on the show and the reason i'm saying this is i have some honorable mentions uh, uh before i get into the list because again it's my list and i've given myself permission to cheat and to at least mention a handful of other games that just missed the list all right so first off and these are all going to be alphanumeric uh, for the honorable mention. So we have 13 days, which is what we call Thinky Filler. It took Twilight Struggle and reduced it down to a 45-minute game. Fantastic. For what it does, absolute just a cracker of a game for what it does. So definitely recommend checking that out. High Treason, The Trial of Louis Real. Now, the reason it didn't make the list, simply put, I kind of expected to like it. And by that, I mean, it. how many games were you're the prosecution or the defense that you know of? One, High Treason, The Trial of Louis Real. Uh, it's cool that I have met the de designer. He is somewhat local. He's about an hour south of us at Colorado Springs. He is a defense attorney, uh, so it's definitely harder for the prosecution to win. He did, when I interviewed Alex Berry, he did jokingly say that uh, played a part, but it really didn't. Uh, so there's that, all right? Uh, so again, 13 days, high treason, trial of Louis Real incorporated which we've only played this uh i think one and a half times the half being a learning game it's a self-produced uh economic simulation game that's a very small print run i believe it actually had two editions but again very small print run uh we're going to be talking more about that in the future just uh didn't know what to think of it when we first ex uh, experienced it but we Again, in our one full play of it, I was like, wow, this actually is a really good model of economics, global economics, and how corporations can influence that. So uh, look for more information on that as we review it down the road. Next is a really old game that got a reprint that I'd never played the original edition. Have it, hadn't played it. Played the second edition, have it enjoyed it and that's Mari Nostrum by Academy Games uh, a Civ game you would think I would like that but I was like eh and not too sure about that for the simple fact that it's a Civ game that you know takes place in plays in less than 
an hour and a, about an hour and a half, less than two hours. I was a little leery about that. Found out, oh, hey, we really dig this. Uh, so review coming on that down the road as well. So that's Mari Nostrom. Then a game I played with our buddy Jim uh, from Punching Cardboard when we went up to Portland. Only played it once, uh, an older game as well, and one that I really didn't expect to like because I've heard there's so much randomness and everything in the game, and that's Shogun. I just ordered it on the Fun Again sale because it's like 20 bucks there. Uh, really a surprisingly good job of being able to uh, program actions and how uh, you have to kind of play the other players in a sense that, hey, you know, I think you're going to do this, so I think I can do that afterwards, or I think you're going to do that, so I need to try and do that earlier than when I anticipate. And it's one of those, you know that I know that you know that I know type games. And I really, really enjoyed it. I mean, we played five hours understand it's not a five-hour game it's just we were sitting around i mean we came up there to visit with friends and everything so we spent more time doing that than we did the actually playing the game but the actual game itself was really a very pleasant surprise so that is another one that uh definitely on the honorable mentions there shogun one last one and this uh came out of nowhere this game is arguably as close it's close to as old as i am i think uh, and had never played it until HeavyCon, and that's Stratomatic Baseball. And we have since uh, gotten a copy, or I should say Asher, our Greyhound, has gotten a copy, compliments of Scotty, uh, Scotty B, who sent him a copy, and he allows us to play his copy. Uh, if you like baseball, and you like stats, and if you like baseball, you probably like stats, and you don't mind dice rolling, which in this context, I really, really don't, uh, Stratomatic Baseball was pretty phenomenal. It's really impressive how they are able to simulate a game uh, that is completely stat-based using dice rolls. And, you know, it's just roll after roll after roll and, and referring to different charts, which I know I realize sounds boring as hell for a lot of folks uh, in this day and age. But for just I was surprised at how much I liked it, and I wouldn't be surprised if this makes Amanda's list because she was a huge, huge fan of it as well. Uh, yeah, I do, don't be surprised to hear a review of this down the road, as well as maybe a live stream of a game. And I love that you can play this over a 162-game season. And the uh, the old saying, you know, a guy played to what's on the back of his baseball card, that kind of will bear out over the course of a 162 game season so yeah so that's the honorable mentions i actually spent longer talking about those than i intended but 13 days high treason trial of louis real uh incorporated mari nostrum shogun and stratomatic baseball so there you go so that's our honorable mentions and by our i mean mine because it's my list and i'm cheating and that's that all right so for those that are going to be listening to the podcast on this afterward, uh, I actually have the live chat up on the screen. It's pretty pretty interesting to follow along with that and seeing people uh, uh, just their takes on all of this. So at the end of all this, I'm going to actually go back and see your guys' thoughts on my top six biggest surprises. Now, to my def or to our defense. Um, it's hard to argue over someone's opinion. I understand that. Uh, and I wanted this one to be a little bit safer for our very first one. This won't always be the case. There may be some definitives that are likely to piss some people off down the road, which that's good because that inspires dialogue, which inspires thinking, which inspires just conversation and and good, good transference of thought between y'all and us and we don't want everyone to agree with everything that we say uh everything that we say we believe we we feel strongly about one way or the other um so it'll be interesting to see how this goes as this top six evolves over the course of i don't know months and years as we continue to do this if folks are enjoying it so it's going to be completely up to y'all whether or not this is something a format that you guys enjoy 
uh, for bonus content than what our live streams on the YouTube channel as well as our reviews on the podcast channel. So, all right. So enough stalling, I guess. Yeah. All right. So here we go. All right. Number six. And I actually have graphics for this. So number six came out in 2014, designed by Bern Eisenstein and published by his own publishing house, which is Iron Games. And that's the horrible art, but really good game, Panthalos. All right. So number six, Panthalos. Now, why? Well, we, we actually reviewed this in episode 53 of the podcast. Would recommend a, if you want a deeper look into the game and a bigger dissection, go check that out. But kind of a really high overview is it's a very clever worker placement game that has a lot of in your face, direct confrontation that a lot of worker placement slash euros you're not going to find. Now, you do have to get past the artwork. As you can see on the on the cover of the box, it has this, this titan with flames coming up from his hands and all of that. They took the worst part of the artwork and then decided, hey, let's put that on the cover of the box. I can't imagine that really helped things. That said, if you're willing to overlook that, the game itself really good. We really enjoyed it. As long as you don't mind some direct confrontation and basically it's 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 a fighting game on top of a worker placement game. So definitely something that surprised us. Uh, I was intrigued uh, when I heard uh, Rado actually talk about it after Essen. I believe it came out at Essen in 2014 and it took me a little while to actually procure a copy, not because it wasn't available, it just wasn't a real high priority, but it had piqued my interest and played it. And wouldn't you know, the overwhelming majority of our local game group really, really was quite smitten with the game. We played it, I want to say like seven, eight times in fairly quick succession. And so we're, we're taking a break from the game for a while now, just because after the review, uh, we'd played it so much and then played it a couple more times after the review we didn't want to completely burn out on it so we're taking a break but that said if it's new to you it's something that we definitely would recommend checking out and that's Panthalos by Bern Eisenstein and Iron Games all right moving on to number five Probably not a big surprise if you're a fan of the show and you have followed along with the Golden Elephant Award finalists from 2016, but 2016 game designed by Cole Worley and published by Holland Spiel, and that's an, inf an in ugh, easy for me to say, an infamous traffic. So this game... I wanted this game solely on the theme, all right? How many opium smuggling games or opium trafficking games that take place in the 18th, 19th century do you know of? I'll wait. Exactly, one. I've always said that a game could be 100% themeless and that would not negatively impact the game for my personal uh, enjoyment of the game. However... A unique and different theme can only accentuate how I feel about a game and enhance. It will never detract from a game. I dig quirky. I like dark. I like controversial. I like things that push the envelope. Um, and this game kind of does that because it's about the opium trade in China in the 18th, 19th century. And not only does the theme really come through, uh, but the game itself is arguably the most opaque game, and I mean this in a complimentary way. So when I say opaque, if you're, if you're new to the show, let me explain this. Opaque to me means, or to us in the, sh in the show in general, means that your decisions right now that you're faced with, you don't always know the consequences of those decisions until much later in the game and on top of that when you're learning the game the mechanics might be clear oh i understand that i move this piece here and i do this 
but the actual understanding of the why you're trying to do it requires repeated play and requires not study because I don't feel like you have to work to get this game, but it does require repeated play to understand the how and the, or not so much the how, but the why of a game and why this interacts with this to make this. So in this game, you're playing as a young scion and a business owner that can either uh, work in the transportation, the smuggling of opium, the merchants, uh, you have merchants at your disposal to then uh, be able to open up the opium dealing in China. Uh, also, the transportation, you have ships available uh, to be able to, to smuggle the opium in. And you also have uh, the actual opium fee farms themselves in which you have to supply, so the opium supply. And you're also competing with the game as a group, but very much individually to compete against the Chinese forces that are trying to thwart your efforts, as well as uh, the bureaucrats who are trying to uh, take a portion of your profits away. And you, there is a ton of interaction as well as a plethora hefe, of uh, emergent uh, partnerships to where you and I might be getting along right now, but five minutes from now, that might not be the case in this one opium supply train that we have going to this one area. And kudos both to Cole as well as the Hollenspiel for taking a risk on a theme that A, is very much off the beaten path, but also... Uh, that's risky because I mean you're it's opium trade it's a drug trade and it is obviously well abstracted to where it's 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 just a super high level look at this game but it's very much um yeah I, I was excited about the theme but the gameplay itself warranted itself being on this list as well as being a 2016 golden elephant award finalist for best game of the year in our opinion 2016 so yeah and infamous traffic now we did do a live stream of this on our youtube channel so if you want to check that out go for it uh we have not sadly reviewed the game yet on the show but look for that soon so an infamous traffic my number five uh biggest pleasant surprise top six Actually, before I go any further, I'm actually going to go back. I think it makes more sense to do this uh, one by one as I look at the uh, as I'm comment as I'm giving my thoughts and everything on the actual games to go back and talk about uh, your guys's comments, uh, the viewers here uh, of the game itself. Um, so going back to number six, which is Panthelos, uh, not a ton. Of discussion on that all right so there's that and then looking at uh millennium blade i'm sorry i see people guessing about millennium blades being higher on this list or not so sorry for the the uh the unrelated talk there all right an infamous traffic so let's see um Wow, just not a lot. All right, so let's move on. All right, so my number four uh, biggest recent surprise is a game also from 2016. Uh, designer Simone Cerruti Sola and published by Placentia Games. And that is Kepler 3042. So this game came out at Essen last year uh, and it was on my not really urgent to go take a look at list, but a it was on my I want to stop by and at least find out a little bit more about it list. So when I came up to the table where it was being demoed at the Placentia Games booth, everybody had this look like head in their hands and everybody studying the board and everything. And I was like, oh, what is this? I must investigate this more. Uh because that whole head in the hand studying look just appeals to me. That makes me 
think that, hey, people are really invested and really studying and, and working and hard at thinking about this game. And I thought that, Okay, let's check this out. So I watched a, a, about a round of the game, and then I talked to the guys at the Placentia Games booth and uh, picked up a copy, brought it home, and we gave it a go. And folks really dug it. Now, it's a little bit on the simpler end. Now, this gets somewhat compared to Solarius Mission that also came out about the same time or at the same time from Spielworks. And that game is a little bit more involved than Kepler 3042. However, uh, it's kind of a 2x game in that you're exploring and exploiting the planets uh, that you're on, that you discover and everything. It's sort of a race in a sense that you're trying to uh, colonize these different planets and then uh, produce on these planets to be able to uh, get more resources so you can do more things so I can do more coke so I can work more hours so I can make more money so I can do more coke yada 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 rinse and repeat now the game plays I think it's over 16 rounds which when we first saw that we were like oh my that seems a bit overkill however as you play the game you realize oh hey these first five six rounds are really quick they're really moving you're building spaceships you're moving out and exploring the the close planets if that's something that you want to do. And it has this cool uh, action selection mechanism that is kind of reminiscent of uh, kind of the, the action selection mechanism that's in Vinos, if you're familiar, to where it's a grid and you have nine selections and you must move to a different selection each turn. The difference here is instead of them being on a common board, everybody has their own action selection to where you're not blocked out and you don't pay anything to be able to do the different actions. Uh, and it has a very uh, enjoyable and clever, I think is a good word, um, resource mechanism or resource conversion mechanism that you only have a finite pool of resources in which to use and you can use some of the spend some of these resources to then uh, get rid of them somewhat permanently to take additional actions and which of the resources you choose because again you have a finite pool of those I think that uh, it's just a really well uh, implemented game and we really enjoyed it now for the longest time, I had said, you're talking to a guy who really does not really enjoy the sci-fi slash space theme. But the more I play him, the more I find out, oh, well, maybe that's not necessarily the case. And the, the planets that are in the game, as well as the uh, science that's in the game, is pretty true to form. There's actually a, a part of the rule book that references all the actual real science that's behind the things that you're doing in this game. So me being a history slash science slash real life buff, I enjoy finding out about and learning and seeing those types of things implemented in the game. And so, yeah, that's why my number four is Kepler 3042 by Placentia Games. Now, some folks are asking, where can we get these games? I'll be honest, I didn't look that up before I came on. If you look them up, probably on BGG, you go to Game Surplus um, or any other store like that or from the publisher. Worst comes to worst, email the publishers. If you're not able to find these games, a lot of times these publishers, especially these smaller publishers, are going to be eager to get in contact with you and let you know, hey, we have copies or, hey, sorry, it's out of print or, hey, go to these fine stores online, etc., etc., to go find those. So definitely would uh, would recommend checking that out. So Dave is asking me, have I played Florenza, also from Placentia? Um, I have, and I enjoyed it. However, that's one game that desperately needs a player aid. Uh, it's impossible to play without it, I feel like, and the font, the very tiny font is a downside. But stay focused here uh, on this. So... Uh, I'm reading the chat here and some folks are saying I've never played it, um, saw it, thought it looked neat. That's pretty cool. Um, going back, Sean asks, where can I get a copy of in Infamous Traffic? Directly from Hollenspiel, their website. Uh, 
I'm reading the comments here, so bear with me. Kepler does not have a North American publisher at this time. Uh, that is true, but hopefully that changes in the coming months. We'll see. All right, and actually, that's a really good point. Somebody pointed out that Kepler 3042 is available on Tabletopia. So if that's your uh, bag, then I would say go check that out. Cool. All right, so that's number four. So a recap of the bottom three, but bottom three of six, really not bad, right? So number six, you have Panthelos. Number five, an, Im an infamous traffic. Really? It's a good thing I don't have a podcast to talk. Number four is Kepler 3042. All right, so that brings us to the top three. Now, number three is an older game. And forgive me, I totally forgot to write what, what year this is. I want to say this was over five years ago. And I apologize for not looking it up. I'm sure the chat will help me out. It's uh, the best game that I have played from the wonder duo that is Kiesling and Kramer, so Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer. It is published by Eagle Griffin Games, as well as a number of other publishers, but those being the main ones here in the U.S. And of course, I am talking about Cavum. So Cavum, if you're familiar with either 18xx games or Age of Steam games, the track lane uh, aspect of this game uh, will be somewhat familiar to you as well. Now, in Cavum, you are uh, building mines and, and different mining shafts in a mountain to then uh, remove gems from the game and then hopefully sell them at the local towns surrounding this mountain. All right, so the theme isn't, you know, exciting terribly. I get that. However, the actual gameplay, really surprisingly excellent. Uh, oh, 2008. Thank you, Fabio and Benjamin. All right, so 2008, Cavum, Kiesling and Hammer uh, by Eagle Griffin Games. So in Cavum, like I said, you're, you're building mine shafts and building these, basically laying track is what you're doing in there, in these mining shafts to go into these uh, deposits of different gems. And then the gems are going to be worth a variable amount depending on the actual market. Each type of gem has a different uh, market value that will be dictated by the demand. If other players are delivering a lot, or you yourself are delivering a lot of these goods, the demand will be less, you will make more, less money. However, the thing that seems to be the point of contention for a lot of folks on this is the fact that you have one at one uh you have access to one tile that is laden with dynamite and dynamite you may not know this explodes and it takes a lot of the surrounding track potentially there are ways to mitigate this uh and ruins the work of yours and or others work of building this track to be able to get to these mineral or these these gem deposits in the game for me a there's ways to mitigate that and b it allows you to think in a different way that a lot of games and a lot of heavier euros don't allow you to think because if you're over there playing your game and I'm over here playing my game and there's not a ton of interaction, it's just whoever does it better, right? Which is fine. There are plenty of games out there. Feast for Odin. Um, okay, no, I'm kidding. But there are plenty of games that are truly multiplayer solitaire out there that have very little interaction. This, however, allow it affords you the opportunity to capitalize on opportunities that your opponents have made. Hey, my opponent just blew up this pretty cool track layout that I had and I no longer have it. Well, now I get to make lemonade out of lemons and maybe there are ways that I can actually exploit what is left of my track and of your track and of other players' track and be able to build in new and inventive ways and 
maybe block other players out that wasn't available to you earlier or maybe wasn't apparent to you earlier. So I see the dynamite in this game that those that tend to not like this game really highlight the chaos that this dynamite uh, imparts in the game. And I, I think it adds to the game instead of detracts. But again, that's that's me. And for what the game is, you're talking an hour and a half, two hour game thereabouts. Um, I, I feel like it's a reasonable amount of player dictated chaos in the game that that I'm okay with and that makes sense. So yeah, and, and having that dynamic market in there also is a great thing because if you're a listener of this show, you want you know that you know we're big fans of economic uh, tomfoolery in games and how I we prefer a more dynamic uh, market or economics uh, in our games, and this definitely has that driven by the players themselves. So yeah. Cavum, really big fan. We actually reviewed it in episode 46. So if you want a deeper dive into that, I would suggest going to heavycardboard.com and checking that out. So that's Cavum, my number three. All right, so let's go back and let's see at the comments. Um, Philip says, another game I've never heard of. Then our, my work here is being accomplished that I'm trying to highlight games that aren't necessarily, I mean, that's kind of what Heavy Cardboard does, right? We, we tend to shine a light on these games that are not, you know, going to always be in the BGG hotness there and there. Uh, Joe Wiggins from the deep end is in the chat and says it's a mean game with mean all in capitals. Totally. Uh, Scott says, desperately need to play this again. Picked it up on the BGG Marketplace after hearing about it in episode 46 uh, on Heavy Cardboard. So awesome. Cool. Um, some folks are saying it's available overseas cheap for like 10 euros. It plays great at all player counts. Uh, gotta love blowing up other people's pass. I agree. All right. Cool. So again, that's number three, Cavum. All right. Which brings us by default to number two, right? Water break. All right, number two, another 2016 game. So again, obviously these are going to be more current because this is the latest greatest type thing, but there is a little bit of older in there with Cavum and uh, Panthalos. So number two, Design or published in 2016 by Wade Broadhead and published by Nightworks. Number two is, of course, a game that a lot of people felt should have been a 2016 Golden Elephant Award finalist, but unfortunately, unfortunately, was just a honorable mention, and that is, of course, Forged in Steel. So. We haven't live streamed it and we haven't reviewed it. Boo on me. That's that's on me. I apologize. So this absolutely belongs high on this list for the simple fact that I got this game because it was part of kind of a tandem Kickstarter uh, that was run by Nightworks because I was more excited about the other game that they were design or uh, publishing, which was Hands in the Sea, which is another local designer's take on the uh, few acres of snow system uh, designed by Martin Wallace. And Hands in the Sea is uh, Carthage versus Rome, uh, the Punic War. So I was super, super excited about that because, well, I mean, Punic War, I'm a big fan of ancient Rome in that time period, plus a few acres of snow revisited and without a broken strategy with the Halifax hammer and all that. Awesome. Can't wait to get it. Forged in Steel. What's this? Well, Don over at Nightworks is a, he's a local publisher down in Colorado Springs as well. And he was like, hey. You want to take a look at this game. It's about the building uh, of the city of Pueblo back in the 19th and turn of the 20th century. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, we'll take a look at the prototype. So Tony and I took a look at it and we were like, yeah, that looks pretty cool. Okay. And kind of that was that. And then 
we actually got when the Kickstarter delivered, uh, Forge and Steel hit the table before Hands in the Sea. I think somebody was asking about it in our group or whatever. So we were like, yeah, we'll check it out. And oh my, hello there, beautiful. And loved it. Absolutely love that game. So it's a card-driven game. If you're, if you're a war gamer at all and you're familiar with games like Washington's War or the Coin System or a plethora of other different games, Pass of Glory, etc., etc., you'll be familiar with card-driven games. So these are they're, they're multi-use cards in a sense that you can uh, usually it's you can either play it for the number that's in one of the corners of the cards like the command value or in this case it's called municipal muscle but it's the command value so it's usually you know on one to five points worth of actions that you can do or you can use it for the event and the event usually is some really super powered really cool thing that you can do but it might not be relevant for what it is that you're trying to do well, again, you're building up the city of Pueblo, Colorado, in the 19th turn of the 20th century using these actions to place houses, to be able to go mine, uh, build mines, to win influence in the different districts uh, on the board, and to eventually become elected mayor. Mayor allows you to win tiebreakers, which is a huge thing because there are, tend to be a lot of ties in this game. And it is very much a confrontational, in-your-face, you know, how you doing type game to where just you're all up in each other's grill the entire game and kind of you can't have the, the ability to be pretty nasty to one another if you choose to. Don't have to play that way, but you can play that way. And it kind of shines a light on how the, the different factions and everything uh, were, were functioning in the city of Pueblo during this time. And, you know, it, it transitioning from an old West to an actual developed town, uh, is fascinating. Now, Wade, I believe worked as a city planner in the city of, or for the city of Pueblo, uh, uh, when in, that was the impetus for him designing this game. And yeah, everybody I know pretty much uh, thoroughly enjoys this game. There are detractors out there that say there's too much randomness in the card draws, this and that. However, you get a hand of cards. You get to bank some cards for later on in the game. So you're kind of uh, working up to the cards that you bank to give you options and know your strategy uh, working on the late game. So I can see why some folks are not going to enjoy this game, but if you enjoy a confrontational card-driven game, uh, and I believe it plays two to four, I think. Uh, definitely something I would highly recommend checking out. Uh, and that's, again, Forged in Steel, by designed by Wade Broadhead and published by Nightworks. All right. Uh, all right. So let's go to the chat and see what folks are saying. Uh, yeah, Joe brings up a good point that just the aesthetic of the board itself, because the buildings are, you know, little, little wooden pieces. The game just has a very pleasing aesthetic look to it when the when the city is built up. It looks good on the table. So definitely, uh, definitely a fan of that as well. All right. So that brings us to number one, huh? So I'm reading the chat here. And seeing what people are thinking, like some folks are saying, oh, it could be Pax Ren, it could be Millennium Blades, it could be an 18xx game, and all of this. So, recap real quick. Number six, Panthelos. Number five, An Infamous Traffic. Number four, Kepler 3042. Number three, Cavum. Number two, Forged in Steel. And the number one biggest recent pleasant surprise for me is a game designed by D. Brad Talton Jr. and published by Level 99 Games. And of course, it can be none other than Millennium Blades. All right. So Millennium Blades. Here's what I knew about it. All right. Going into it. 
it's a totally meta game about playing as players who play CCG tournaments. So let's look at the reasons I was intrigued and the reasons I should hate this game. So reasons I was intrigued. I used to play Magic. A lot of us used to play Magic the Gathering back in the day. Maybe a lot of y'all still do. Uh, I, I burned out on it and got out of it uh, many moons ago. I want to say in the around the turn of the century, around 2000, give or take a couple years. Uh, so I was completely burnt out on CCGs. So I was, I was familiar with them, having played them for a number of years, Magic predominantly. So I was intrigued that you're not playing... You're not collecting cards like a CCG. You are playing as players who are playing CCGs. And I was like, that's so meta. That that shouldn't that shouldn't work. That shouldn't be a thing. And then I got to thinking, if they pulled that off, though, that'd be kind of cool, right? That'd be clever. So, okay. So, there was that. So, that's why I was intrigued by the game. All right? So, why shouldn't I like it? Well, the law, the list is long. So first off, the artwork, the anime or manga, I'm not sure which that is, I apologize. Uh, not at all, even a tiny little bit of a fan in the least. It has real-time aspects of collecting cards and everything are done in three different groups of seven minutes, then seven minutes, then six minutes. Uh, yeah, real-time and me don't get along. There's just, I, I just don't dig it. I don't like real-time strategy video games. I much prefer turn-based. So yeah, not a fan of that. The random draws that are in the game. You're just drawing things like you would draw. Th these represent the best card in a pack that you would open whenever you play a CCG or whenever you buy packs for a CCG. Yep, not if you're familiar with heavy cardboard we're not super keen on randomness at least not a lot of it and this this has a, a whole lot of it and then just the concept of the game ccgs dude i'm burnt out on this i i really shouldn't like it so there are a whole lot of reasons why i should not like this game and honestly not a whole lot that i should like it yet i love it i absolutely love this game i am shocked at its ability to simulate what it's like to play in CCG tournaments as a player, but without building decks like you would in a CCG. It's part of the reason we haven't reviewed this yet is because this is a hard game to really wrap your head around because it's, it's really, there literally is nothing out there that is even remotely close to what it is that this game does. Um, it has approximately 42 million different cards in the game. I'm not kidding. The stack um, is, when you make this stack of cards, it's almost a foot tall of cards. Uh, the It has 79 million different expansions and little uh, ways you can seed the initial deck. Setup is a bit of a beast. Uh, it's one of, those, one of those games that once it's set up and you've seeded your deck, you kind of use that setup for a handful of games before you then go and sort it and then make a new one. So that kind of alleviates some of the setup and tear down aspect of the game. But the actual playing of the game, and we really hesitate to use the word fun when it comes to this podcast or the YouTube channel, because fun, your definition of fun and my definition of fun can be vastly different. A lot of people call Arkwright, it looks like a spreadsheet and it plays like a spreadsheet. I would disagree. I thoroughly enjoy that. That is fun for me. Other people look at that and be like, that's the epitome of work to me. So I can't say what is going to be fun for you, or I can only say what is fun for me. So I try not to use that term and Amanda avoids using that term as, as often as possible. Or use it as, le as, as few and far between as possible. That said, this has got to be the most fun game that I think I may have ever played that isn't like a dexterity game. The amount of decisions, and with it being a real-time strategy game in some aspects, not the entire game is real-time, but some of it, the, the constructing of your, of your different... Um, 
the cards you're going to sell and the cards you're going to use in the tournament and this and that. That is done in three different seven minute, seven minute, then six minute uh, real time segments. That adds such a layer of stress, but stress in a good way where you see that time clicking off and you're like, uh, what do I do? What do I do? And it forces you to make really fast decisions. But at the same time, these are meaningful decisions. It The game just doesn't allow you to tank an AP. And there's something to be said about that because Lord knows we're all guilty of it from time to time. And then the actual how you the strategies that you want to employ in this game require a lot of thought and me and they are meaningful decisions which ultimately are the games that we want to highlight yes real time not a fan the artwork really not a fan of that the randomness in opening up those packs so to speak uh, a lot of reasons that there there, there shouldn't be a lot of meaningful decisions in this game yet there are and it's man it, it it's really hard to nail down why this game is so fun especially coming from somebody who's burnt out on ccgs you know i'll be damned if it's just not a lot of fun to play it really legitimately is um if this sounds like something that you're mildly interested in I would try it before you buy it. I would try and find a friend uh, or go to a con and find somebody that has it there. Um, it's not a huge investment. Uh, it, it, it It's what, I don't know, 50, 60 bucks. So it's a standard game price, but it's not definitely not going to be for everybody. I really, I got it more as a curiosity than anything. Just so ended up that I ended up loving the game. Um, uh, Matt, who is the technical guru behind Heavy Cardboard, uh, wasn't really big into CCGs and, and wasn't a big fan of his first play. However, the more it's kind of sat with him, he's wanted to play it again. So, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Amanda was a was a pretty big fan of it as well. I mean, obviously, it, it got to be a Golden Elephant Award finalist. It's definitely not going to be for everybody. I understand that. There are going to be some that are like, what? It's not a heavy game. I could make the argument that it is in some aspects. And some folks are going to be like, wow, I thoroughly hated that game. And that's okay. Not every game has to match with every person. There are plenty of game, mainstream games out there uh, that I, I have zero interest in playing. And that's okay. Play what you dig, right? But for me, the most pleasant, biggest surprise of the recent memory has got to be Millennium Blades. So yeah, that's uh, that's my top six. So I am curious to hear and read and interact with y'all and find out uh, if you guys think I'm nuts or a terrible list, great list, whatever, or what your top six list would be. So if you want, either hit us up in the chat you can always email us, Twitter, Facebook, contact at heavycardboard.com. Go to the website, heavycardboard.com, and you can touch base with us there. There's a way to contact us through that on the forum. We'd love to hear about this. I'm genuinely curious what y'all's top six would be. Most recent pleasant surprises. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll leave it at that, all right? And yeah, for everybody watching at home, Definitely appreciate y'all joining in and let us know if this is content that you find interesting and would like more of uh, different various top six. If you're listening on the podcast, then same thing. Let us know what you think. We definitely want to hear from y'all. Uh, yeah. So with that said, live streams coming up sometime soon. Uh, we have uh, Rococo. We have Terraforming Mars. We have Hammer of the Scots, Container, a whole bunch of others. Uh, just keep an eye out for the schedule. And thanks for watching, everybody. All right. I appreciate it. And don't forget, if you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash heavy cardboard. All this bonus content is brought to you truly by y'all and by our patrons. Because without them, this doesn't happen. And if you would like it to continue to happen, 
consider supporting us. We really, really appreciate it. We'll catch you all later. Bye, guys.